It is Monday, December 18th, 2017. My name is Ashton Ellett, here with another installment of the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Joining us today is Mr. Oscar Persons, Senior Counsel at the law firm of Strickland Brockington Lewis here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Persons. You're welcome. Honored and privileged to have you here, somebody who, who reaches way back into the history of the, the Georgia Republican Party uh, as, a, as a party official, party activist. Um, really great to have you um, here to talk about politics and history uh, of this state. A footnote that probably doesn't appear anywhere, but you mentioned Richard B. Russell. Mm -hmm. When I was president of the student body at Georgia Tech, I got to go up to uh, be on what was called a college news conference, and Senator Russell was there. Uh, and there was a, a woman there who was, was involved, uh, a, a college person involved, but I got a picture of myself and, and Dick and Senator Russell is one of my favorite pictures. Well, it's, prob it's probably somewhere in the, in the Richard B. Russell Library. Um, Could be. Down in the collections. We'll have to dig it out for you. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about, um, you mentioned Georgia Tech. Tell me a little bit about your childhood, your upbringing, mm -hmm. uh, and education. Sure. My father was a Baptist preacher. Uh, we moved around a whole lot, small towns, although he went to uh, the University of Georgia and then the Yale Divinity School. He wanted to come back uh, to the Missionary Baptist and uh, small churches. He was not political. So, uh, although I was born in McCormick, South Carolina, I lived in uh, Louisville, Alamo, Fort Gaines, Tolleton, uh, McCormick, Columbus, where I went to high school at Columbus High, and then I went to Georgia Tech. Now, why did you uh, why did you opt for Georgia Tech instead of the University of Georgia? I wanted to be a scientist. Uh, something tells me you deviated. <laughs> <laughs> Of course. Yeah, I did. Somewhere I I, I, uh, I was enamored with uh, science and those things. I had a Gilbert chemistry set when I was 10 and loved playing with that. Uh, but I guess, and I did well at Georgia Tech, and I graduated as an engineer. I had a job with Southern Bell after that, running their employment office and then on their kind of uh, accelerated management trainee program. But I... Still was looking for something a little different, and they had, uh, they would pay for your grad school. And this is Southern Bell? Uh, Southern Bell. And they would either pay for you to go, in, in my case, uh, I was working during the day to a business school like Georgia State or Emory Law, which had a law program at night at that time. So I opted for uh, law school and I uh, worked with them during the day and went out there three, uh, two nights a week uh, to law school. It took me an extra year to graduate, but in the meantime, I had married and was able to come do the last year in day school. So you, you were active while you were at Georgia Tech. Um, no, I became active in politics when I got back from the Navy. Okay, and when was that? You there were with the Seventh Fleet. That was, about, that was about 1962. Okay. And I'd just gotten out and <clears throat> came to Atlanta looking for a job. And the folks who were my age in the 20s at that time, a lot of whom were, had gone to Georgia Tech, were in this young Republican organization, which I kind of liked. I was single and I didn't like the segregationist Dems at the time. and. Uh, so the, we didn't use that term then, the cool thing in Buckhead at that time was to belong to the Young Republican Club and go to the Th TGI Friday beer parties because mm -hmm. there were no bars basically in the, in the uh, mid sixties in Atlanta. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. You'd have to come downtown. And you know we charge fifty cents a drink or something. It was a good meeting place for guys and gals, and 
I became president of it in uh, the late 60s, and it was the largest young Republican club in the United States. And, and for my recollection, there was no sort of analog to a young Democrat, d young Democrats organization. Uh, not really. I think no Chuck Chuck Greeby uh, was a big damn young mm -hmm. guy, but they didn't really have the the mass of folks that we did. Even Ted Turner used to come to our meetings. Well, t tell me about the Republican Party in the early 1960s. The the, the Georgia organization. This is when. Uh, the, the leaders would have been people like, like James Dorsey, Bob Snodgrass, yeah. so, as that, you said, Buckhead. Right, well, that was that. The, the people with whom I came in most contact uh, were uh, Mike Egan, Dick, Dick Freeman, right. R Rodney Cook, um, Jarvin Levison, mm -hmm. who were older, and uh, some of them had been aldermen you know, in the city of Atlanta. And, you know, that was kind of it because this was before either Ben Blackburn or Fletcher Thompson right. or Bo Calloway had been elected to Congress. And, you know, the, the party organization at that point was uh, titles and keeping the, the structure going, uh, raising a little money. And I, uh, it was a, uh, we, the younger, uh, Fulton County Young Republicans developed a number of leaders, and uh, I was one of them. Uh, we had a, uh, it was because of that uh, presidency of the Young Republicans that I got appointed to be an assistant general counsel. Okay by uh, Bo Calloway, who was with the Bar to be at that time, and Bill O'Kelly was the general counsel, and so I kind of learned at the feet of Bill O'Kelly. We wrote the the rules of the party, which now kind of, with, a, with some changes, exist today. And But still, it was, it was uh, you know, who's gonna be first vice chairman West, and. You know, first vice chairman of East, and he's going to be the assistant to, to the chairman. And but then uh, things began to change. Uh, I think after the Republicans f saw that Bo Calloway got, uh, you know, but for the right-hand vote, would have would have won. Mm -hmm. That those really really smart people out in uh, the Henry area, <laughs> who wrote in. Uh, <laughs> He didn't, know, he didn't like sell it. They didn't like segregationist Maddox, so they were going to show, and they wrote in Ellis Arnold. They got segregationist Maddox, but it b became okay after that point to be a Republican. Uh, and you still we're, we're such a minority. I was uh, at Alston Miller and Gaines when I joined Alston Miller. Philip Alston took me over one day at lunch. Have you heard this story? No, 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 no. To, uh, and he knew I was involved with uh, Paul Coverdale, who was a state senator at that point, and that I went in and told Philip Austin that that was going to be a $100 a plate fundraiser for Paul Coverdale. I just happened to mention that he writes a check for me because I didn't have the money then. But... Uh, a year or so later, I was waiting at the elevator to go across the street and have some lunch. And uh, Mr. Alston came up and said, Oscar, what are you doing for lunch? He said, won't come, come, just walk over to the see uh, Governor Carter. So we went under the, you know, that railroad thing at First National Bank. So he breezes into uh, Governor Carter's office with me in tow and he says, Governor Carter, this is Oscar Persons. He's our Republican. <laughs> Quote, unquote. <laughs> well, what was it like to be uh, a Republican lawyer in a Democratic town, Democratic state? Well, I felt like we were correct on the ideology and that we were making, uh, making some waves that it would take some time. But all the power levers were Democrat. I mean, all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, we, and when I was on, I made an interesting story with the uh, 
think Matt Patton was involved in this, but later when they were having the presidential preference primaries, uh, he and I uh, were appointed to that group because the Dems had a majority, so we were in, I think, Joe Frank Harris's house or office over at the Capitol. And, uh, you know, Joe Frank Harris, you know, got all the other Dems in there and said, well, it looks like we're going to do this and that. And, and uh, either matter, I said, well, you know, are you going to have a motion on that? I said, can we discuss it? And they were kind of astonished. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, they had a motion and <laughs> furtive discussion, and, <laughs> <laughs> and of course it passed. But a summary of your answer is that there was optimism mm -hmm. uh, in the Republican Party then. Um, I think that kind of went down when uh, uh, Nixon right. uh, resigned. Uh, that was a a bad time. Um, I worked, uh, I was fairly naive. I thought Barry Goldwater was going to beat Lyndon Johnson. Right. You, 64. I, I, well, he, he did know, win, uh, he did win Georgia. He, he won Georgia and I, I worked uh, as the uh, kind of go for campaign uh, Director for Ed Chapin, who was running for Congress the seventh against day. John da John Davis in the seventh, and we thought we could win that because of Goldwater, but uh, he beat us by about seven points, I think. So, were you a member of of, of the draft, Joe Tribble and, and Bo Calloway, the draft Goldwater movement or, or uh, organization? I, I, I got on board late. I was okay. probably more okay. Mike Egan. Uh, Right, because there was a real with, showdown uh, And there. he was with uh, Scranton. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't care for Rockefeller, uh, <laughs> who Newt was for at the time. Yeah. And you know that. Yeah, his, he was, uh, in, at least in 68, I know, he was, yeah, uh, he yeah, was his he director was, yeah, over out in Tulane. Came, yeah. But, no, I came, and it became pretty obvious that Goldwater was going to be the person. So my friends were, I joined in with my friends and, uh, you know, thought he was going to win. I was electrified by his speech and wherever it was. Uh, In fact, San, San Francisco. Yeah. Back to uh, Ted Turner, when uh, there was a Young Republican National Convention in San Francisco in 1963, I believe it was. And there were eight or nine of us that went out there as delegates from Georgia. And we kind of went with the, the moderate uh, candidate, and I forget his name, McDevitt. And Buzz Lukens was the more right. conservative go water thing, and Lukens crushed everybody in sight. But Dad Turner's first wife, Jane, was one of those delegates. <laughs> and Times change. <laughs> time, time, times change. So, you know, I felt pretty proud of, of all of us who were back to, during that time of kind of at least keeping the foundation going and keeping it credible. We didn't have any scandals. Um, I mean, some people didn't pay any attention to us, but then when they started paying attention to us, it was kind of beginning to be too late. That was kind of like the Mattingly thing and later the Coverdale thing. Mm -hmm. They kind of took it for granted that, you know, Republicans weren't going to be anything but sheriffs and folks up in North Georgia and the old. Union counties, and that would be it. The mountain Republicans up there. Yeah. So what would, and this is obviously you know, conjecture, what would it have meant to the development of the Republican Party in Georgia had Bo Calloway been able to get those 50, 50 percent plus one and beat Lester Maddox? Well, I think we'd have, we would have had a kinder, gentler 
so to speak, using uh, Herbert Walker's fr phrase. <coughs> Executive, I mean, he would have had trouble with the legislature because he would have been Governor Fish and then the foul were the, the legislators, but the governor has a lot of power. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I, I think he would have done a, a really good job. So you said you became um, assistant counsel. Mm -hmm. um, what what year would that have been? That would have been about uh, late sixties. It was after the after I had helped because I'd helped the Young Republican Club had very much helped Bo Calloway in his oh, campaign. Sure, we sure. did flyers and all that. And I think it would and Calloway, although he had lost was still very much power. I lost the uh, governorship. And it was in that time that I got appointed. Will Bowens was another one who was an assistant. I was probably in the pecking order. He was, he was an assistant with a capital A and I was an assistant with a small A. But <laughs> nevertheless, there were the two of us and then there was Bill O'Kelly the top, and it, as you know, it's interesting that later in time, uh, I, started, I did that for about 20 or 25 years, and then uh, Frank Strickland came in, and then Ann Lewis, and so. How would you describe the, the Republican Party organization, um, sort of the state central committee? Um, you already mentioned Bo Calloway, and Bo Calloway really did have an outsized Mm. influence over the party. Uh, this is a time when, when Paul Jones from Macon was, was state chair. Wiley Wasden was there for, yeah. uh, that was a, a tumultuous uh, cycle. Well, I think there were a lot of people that had hats and, and little cattle. Uh, again, what you were fighting for at that time, since we weren't fielding many candidates, you were fighting for the place at the at the head table where, where you were going to be at the chairman's thing or are you going to be mm -hmm. down at the first vice chairman west and there were some ideological struggles going on there which Joe Tribble particularly was uh, kind of out there in my view. Right. Who uh, came in with Goldwater. The, yeah. And Roscoe Pickett was another who came, well. Roscoe he, Pickett. He was ousted by Callaway as national yeah, committee, yeah. Written, but he was still in the party. So, so I would say it was more, it kept the name alive and there were no scandals. In terms of a political clout, mm -hmm. could it get out votes? Did it have a machine? It didn't have a machine. It right. had very little money. You know, one person in the office uh, but it, was, it got some press and uh, was able to articulate some of the uh, Republican ideas, which was good. So, you know, you, we've already talked about you know, sort of the, the negative impact of, of, of the Nixon scandal, the Watergate scandal. Mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy Carter, who you already mentioned, went on to become president. Mm -hmm. Was that also sort of a, a, a stunting factor for the Republican Party organization, the fact that here you had the former governor of Georgia at the top of the ticket? Or do you think it was there, there were other factors beyond that, sort of keeping the, oh, I mean, the Republicans I, I, down? No, I, I, don't, I don't think we had it. That was in, uh, what, 76? Right, yeah. You know, I don't think we had any idea that we were on a par with the Democratic Party at that time, because we weren't, we didn't have any power. So, you know, the fact that one of the power Dems in Georgia got elected wasn't any big shakes to us. Right. Well, when do you think, when do you think the party started to, to make that transition from sort of, it wasn't, wasn't post office Republicanism, you know, during the, no, that, that period, was, that, that was, was way back in the day, back, yeah. but, but it was, sort of clubbish, factionalized, not to say that there aren't factions even today, but when do you think the party really 
started to make the first step towards a, a modern professional party organization? Well, I would I would say even though there were struggles then, I would say it was when uh, Mike Egan and Randolph Thrower and Jarvin Levison uh, and uh, some of the, uh, Senator Dan McIntyre and mm -hmm. Ben O'Callaghan and some of those people uh, got some traction and they attracted followers and uh, they were what you would call now establishment Republicans. Right. I don't think that name was, a, I think they would, call, would be called regular Republicans then, but I'm not sure that we differentiated. But I would, I would put it at that and then you had, uh, you know, Thompson and Linder mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Blackburn and uh, what would I say, I might maybe get my sequence different. But you had Blackburn and you had uh, Fletcher Thompson and you In had 66. Bo. Callaway was not, uh, and of course the thing that, that took us out of our doldrums was, uh, was Ronald Reagan. Right, right. So, when but, does, you know, when, I, when, I, I, oh, sorry. I, I was I was a Ford person, so I was kinda, right. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this is seventy six. Yeah, obviously. I went I went to the convention in Kansas City. I was a, I was a uh, an alternate delegate, and uh, you know, Ford made a okay speech, and <laughs> I mean Reagan lit the house on fire, and then yeah. she. Nancy Reagan comes in town with her red dress on, and the crowd goes crazy. Did you feel like uh, at that point you you had made the wrong decision? I, well, I liked Ford. He'd sure, come in, sure. He'd come in. He campaigned for uh, he campaigned for Ed Chapin. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, I'd, I'd met him. Uh, Reagan, at that time, I felt had surrounded himself with people who were a little more radioactive than I felt like sort I of was. A far out position. Well, I wouldn't say far fringe. out. No, I would say uh, not establishment folks. Okay. Okay. But you know, in hindsight, they they backed the right person because he was a, a wonderful president. And so I'd say when Reagan got in. When did yeah. Senator uh, Coverdell become active in sort of the? In a he big was way? active in the '60s. He ran for state senate and won. And then he served down there as uh, he may have been the Republican leader in the state senate. Such as it was, I mean. Yeah, was, five or five or six. Yeah, there were not that many. But he did a good job. He helped get the pension, some pension laws in. Well, you know, because there were so many unfunded pensions down in the legislature. And he's, you know, he's a workaholic. <laughs> and you know, when the time came, he jumped in, and because Mattingly was the Interesting right. one. Right. Were you at? No, you yeah, were, you I was very active with okay. Mattingly. In fact, I was his campaign counsel. All right. T tell me about the, the Mattingly camp campaign. How it, how he decided to run. You sort of your your expectations yeah. going to that race against Senator Town. Again, it just you know he had a following. Mac had a following in, on the coast, and. He uh, he had the conservative uh, mojo, <laughs> and he wasn't Talmadge, and he was had, that last he, part. He had, the... Yeah, he had the gumption to. Nobody else, you know, Talmadge was an icon. Sure, he sure. Can, you know, that name alone. That name alone was. So, you know, people would say, why am I going to waste my time running against Herman Talmadge? But Talmadge was, feet were beginning to show some wear, of clay, and uh, Mac had the courage to jump in. 
I'd say probably <clears throat> Fred Cooper was one of the, he knew him pretty well. I didn't, mm -hmm. one of the people that kind of encouraged him to do it. Uh, so, you know, it was a thrill automatically win, winning the, which again gave credibility to the party. <clears throat> I was about to ask, you know, besides the, you know, the obvious uh, morale boost, what, what is the practical uh, fallout of having, or the practical effect of having a, a Republican United States Senator in the early 1980s for the, for well, the state Well, I party? think we had, uh, you know, you had Reagan as the president, mm -hmm. so Matt got to, you know, position folks for U.S. judges. Right, right. And, you know, he had his input, he had his screening committee. Uh, so that alone was some clout that we had not had in, mm -hmm. in the Republican Party. <clears throat> and you know, I wasn't one that was seeking an appointment or anything. <clears throat> so I didn't really follow, you know, who got the the Undersecretary of, you know, Housing and Urban Affairs and <laughs> all that. Uh, but there were some that were and some that weren't. Now, you stayed general counsel to the party, I think you said 25 years, give or take? I stayed, right. I stayed until uh, when I got involved in the Bob Dole campaign in 95, I guess it was. Okay. I kind of dropped out resigned and it was either 95 or it was either, or 96 when he actually had gotten the nomination sure, sure. in that time. But I'd been counsel ever since, because Bill O'Kelly went on the bench. Right, that's right. So, and then I, so I was the, the GC. How had the party changed in terms of uh, its, its finances, its ability to, to find and field candidates in, in those, in that quarter century. Um, you oh, were, you it, were you know, dramat uh, it, you know, dramatically, it, uh, uh, started raising some money. I'd say Fred Cooper is one of the big mm -hmm. guys on that. <clears throat> then you had people who were willing to be candidates because you had, Mattingly had won, so that gave some cover, right? Shade to uh, other people, and by that time you had, uh, even though they were maybe, you know, an inch thick, we still we had party organizations in most of the counties in Georgia, so they could have some get out to vote, and we were able to hire some. Cons uh, some, uh, you know, get out the vote team folks and so forth and so on. Um, but, uh, yeah. Now, uh, the Democratic Party, you know, historically the parties, the party organizations in Georgia are not necessarily strong parties. Um, would you say the Republican Party, because of its, it, its status as sort of permanent minority, permanent opposition, by necessity had done more than, the, than the, its Democratic uh, colleagues had done in terms of well, party I wouldn't, building? I, I wouldn't frame it that way. Okay. I would say that the Republican Party organization was Democrat with a, a, lot, a small d because it was a grassroots, you elected your precinct folks. Oh, right, and then all the you, way up. All the way up, so it was a Democratic, whereas the, the big D Democratic Party was more pushed down. Yeah. The governor was- Governor appointed. Governor appointed and then uh, everything else, yes sir. <laughs> and so I think that helped when I'm not sure I can put my finger on discrete things that happened from that, but I think logically it helped. Now that sort of small d democratic precinct meetings, 
district meetings, uh, county meetings, caused a bit of trouble in 1988. Oh, yeah, I was the, right in the middle of it. You, you were right in the middle of it. Yeah. So I, I want to get your, uh, for ni 1988, this was... Uh, 88. 88. You were with Senator Dole's, a supporter of Senator mm -hmm. Dole originally. Um, and there was Vice President Bush was right. in the race, uh, uh, other uh, Jack Kemp. Um, but the one that caused the issue here in Georgia was, was, was Reverend Pat Robertson. Oh, yeah. I, I can feel you. I mean, I can tell you a lot of stuff on that. But here's the... the uh, and there's plenty of fault to go around. Sure, sure. The... Uh, the party regulars began to see that supporters of Pat Robertson were basically packing the various precinct meetings, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and became concerned. And there was a rule in the state rules that was utilized to say, well, at least, you know, you might have gotten this vote in, the, in this particular precinct, but you didn't fill your forms out right. Or, <laughs> so I, I don't remember specifically all that, but there were some uh, things that, if you look back on, were probably not uh, good things, but neither was the Run, run the uh, run the other guys out approach of the Pat Robertson folks, and that was it. I mean, and anybody in was kind of out and bye bye, and we're taking over, and we'll see you around Hasta Luego. <laughs> so there was a uh, there was a state convention down there, down in Albany, Albany yeah. which split because you couldn't. You, know, you had the people who were griping about the rule thing that they couldn't vote. And you had the other people who said, oh, yeah, well, they shouldn't be able to vote. And, they, and it was a John Stuckey breaks his <laughs> gavel. So I had to come up to my son's uh, high school graduation, so I missed the <laughs> gavel break it. But so there, was a, uh, there were basically two conventions. Mm -hmm. So what to do? Well, the state, state, the entire state committee was called to rule on it because there was a dispute about what delegates were going to be sent to New Orleans. Right, because the Robertson folks sort of stayed and restarted a rump convention. Yeah, and the other people kind of said they had their convention out there too. So we, uh, and I, I really don't remember whether the position with the regulars was that there were two conventions or the position was that the convention had failed. I think it was that the convention had failed. I think, it, yeah, I think you're and right. And therefore, because it had failed in the state, the big state committees, a few hundred folks yeah, I think could make the decision. I think you've got it. So the big state committee uh, met and it sent out a uh, slate of folks. And the Robertson f folks sent out their slate of delegates. And we had a trial before the uh, Credentials Committee, and I, I was the lawyer representing the right. party regulars, right. and Matt Patton was the lawyer on the other side. It became fairly acrimonious. Mm -hmm. And we put on evidence, you know, we called folks and we called, had affidavits to argue that, you know, what the state party committee had done was correct because the rules said the state party committee, in cases that had, like had occurred, could do the, could make decisions. Well, Herbert Walker didn't have any uh, cajones. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, he was so afraid that there was going to be a uh, rebellion on the floor by the Robertson folks. So he decided to give them a bone. And uh, voila, the Credentials Committee comes back and gives the delegation to the Robertson folks by one vote. It did not include me, and I would just happened to see uh, the lawyer for the Bush campaign, Kay Holiday, I think it was Kay, told her, do you just realize that you did not have the Dole chairman on there? And she blanched and goes into the other room and 
voila, <laughs> out comes the, I'm on the list. And so there was a very contentious, you know, meeting with the National Republican National Committee on that issue and so forth. Uh, and then there was the issue of uh, the delegation itself choosing the chair of the delegation. Right. And uh, th they uh, elected that uh, Pat Swintle. I mean, you know, Newt Gingrich was running, a, and uh, yep. so Swindle. So it was a it was a bad thing to the extent that Margaret. Uh, what's her name? The oh, uh, uh, Marguerite Williams. Marguerite Williams, you've heard the story. Oh, I want to hear you. Uh, I, I want to hear it from you. Mar Marguerite <laughs> Williams. Uh, Pat Swindle, I think, told her that uh, Marguerite, uh, Pat Robertson is going to come over here and, and say hello to you. And she said, I'm not about to talk to that scoundrel, quote unquote. So, you know, that did, did not help on the money flow for the. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, you know, since that time, uh, everybody's kissed and made up. Uh, but this is true. I mean, there were there were no malingerers on either side, and uh, but it was not a happy time. But but you know, your contention is that that the state party um, organization, John Stuckey, chairman, followed the rule, wh whether they were heavy handed or not, followed the rules. But the the Bush organization sort All of right, just I would, their well, hand. I would say that. The people who were going to control the convention for the, the establishment Republicans, quote unquote, mm -hmm. probably read a lot of fine print in the rules to try to prevent the Robertson takeover mm -hmm. at the convention. But once that happened and the convention did fail, then it was the uh, province of the big state committee to I make see. the decision. I see. So that was absolutely correct. So in '92, um, as as you said, there there was it was acrimonious and there was a bit of, a bit mm -hmm. of a split. But you can't come back in well '89, I guess. Um, Alec Poitavent becomes uh, mm -hmm. party chairman. Pretty close contest with former chairman Matt Patton. Mm -hmm. um, Tell me about the 1990s. This was really sort of the, if you want to talk, say, the real growth spurt of the party in terms of elected officials mm -hmm. and clout, really in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. what, what factors do you think? Well, I mean, you had, you know, you had uh, uh, Bush as president, uh, Herbert Walker, in, uh, in 1990, and the patronage that goes with that. Uh, there were still some wounds being licked from the 88 situation, but not as vitriolic as it had been. People had kind of sat back and relaxed more. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> and you had uh, Weiss Fowler had, of course, uh, beaten Mac, which was that's right made, made everybody angry. Republicans, and they felt like that Weiss was a liberal too. And, you know, he <laughs> went out and had drinks at the at the uh, with George Mitchell, and they were buddy buddies. And I don't mind going out and having a drink, but, <laughs> but that he had basically aligned himself with the liberal wing of the Democratic Party, and you know, covered El Sol an opening. And of course, you had the four elections. Right, right. Uh, Paul Coverdell had to. I mean, there was a primary. There was a primary. John there was a primary Knox, runoff. Bob Barr was uh, right, and the primary runoff result was only about a one percent mm -hmm. difference for in Coverdell's. And uh, the result of that uh, was known when. Uh, Our daughter was born, so I remember that. It's the same day that Bill Clinton was elected president, which is so got good news and bad news. <laughs> so, and then you had, uh, you 
had the run uh, the the contest with Weish, mm -hmm. and Weish won by about a percentage point, but it was not fifty percent. Right. So there was another runoff in Kevlar uh, won. Why, why do you think that is? This was still a Democrat. Bill Clinton had won the state in 92. Well, Weiss, you know, was an Atlanta guy, quote unquote. So was Paul, but Weiss was, couldn't really get people excited in South Georgia. Okay. Um, and I think the Dems just didn't turn out. And you had Margie Lopp, that Margie Lopp song, you know about that. No. Oh, I don't, you need, I don't to, think you so. need to pull that up. Margie Lopp was hired by Tom Perdue to cut a commercial for Paul. And she's just 100% South Georgia Southern lady. She's sitting on a swing on her front porch and she's saying, Let's put Paul Coverdell in the Senate and put Weiss Fowler out. Bum, bum, bum. Then she went on and on. It became a jingle. You could <laughs> hear people whistling it around, and uh, that was, to some extent, a game changer. It got his name out there when he didn't have money. I, mean, I was his chair. Right. And we didn't have money to do much, but it was a perfect. But you, you ought to pull that up. It's Margie Lopp. L O P P. She's dead. You mentioned South Georgia. South Georgia, for anybody who follows Georgia politics, or I mean Southern politics, you know, rural, the rural South, deeply conservative, um, economically, socially. Mm. Why were, were were the Democrats, be it, be it uh, George Busby, Joe Frank Harris, Zell Miller? Sam Nunn, able to hold on to, to conservative whites and at the same time African Americans in the countryside and the well, city. Well, they had the sheriffs. They had the county uh, physicians, the clerks, the probate judges. The, the, the courthouse crowd. The, they basically had the courthouse and, you know, that's a huge advantage. And there was still obviously some, uh, you know, Republicans were the parties of the black. Uh, not I guess the Civil War, Reconstruction. Reconstruction. But, you know, I'm not a political scientist, so I, I, I'm not the good one to answer. But that was my impression is that they had more courthouse clout. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for a long time, there was not a Republican ballot. Right. Not until uh, Frank knows 68, about that, 70. He was involved in getting a ballot into, you ask him about that. But I guess it was the blue ballot back Yeah, he's when you had one ballot if you asked for different ballot that kind of look at you cro were. cross eyed <laughs> yeah right and and they number one and number two they would they would know who you were speaking of ballots um, ballot access you were you were general counsel when david duke mm -hmm. was trying to get it mm -hmm. you, tell me about because that's sort of been lost i think to to time is that well he it, it was a uh, not a ballot well he was I forget, it went up to the Supreme Court. Uh, he wanted to, in order to have your name listed on the presidential preference primary ballot, you had to had X percent mm -hmm. of the vote from some previous election, and he wanted to be on the presidential preference primary ballot, and he didn't have it. <clears throat> so he sued the uh, attorney general and the Republican Party, and I represented the, Re and Alston represented the Republican Party, and then Mike Bowers, I believe, represented the AG. And, you know, it was determined that, no, he doesn't have a right to 
Was was there? A, was it simply just because letter of the law? He was all because because I Alec Poitiment made a very strong strongly worded statement that that the Georgia Republican Party didn't want him on the ballot. Well, no, it and, didn't. It, it and didn't. And neither did George H. No, w. no, Bush, it, it the didn't want him in the, on the ballot. Uh, but he didn't get on the ballot because the Georgia Republican Party didn't want him on there. He got on the ballot, didn't get on the ballot because he hadn't satisfied the conditions. I mean, nobody wanted, I mean, God, we didn't, nobody wanted David Duke. What Speaking that, of radioactive. What was that, that bumper strip they had said, oh, you know, uh, it, it vote for the crook, it's important. Edwin, uh, Edwin Edwards, was that it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> vote for the crook. Vote for important. the crook, it's important. And they, that was, all right. And that, and that was that was President Bush's uh, basically endorsed that that idea. Um, so 90, uh, 96 rolls around. That's where you get involved. Well, don't don't move too fast. Past okay. Ninety two because here you have a man. Paul Coverdale has kind of a, a high pitched voice. Mm hmm. And talks like this when he's making his points. Extremely smart extremely hardworking. But he was able to beat Weiss Fowler, who was a darling of the, and that was a big damn deal. Mm -hmm. and, and such a big deal that, you know, they had a, there was a suit filed by Common Cause or some other organization that said, oh, you know, the runoff election thing is and wrong and they tried to get George Mitchell to not seat. And that was the Senate Majority Leader at the time. That was the Senate Majority Leader, but Doe talked him into, because they were friends, mm -hmm. the seating him. So that was an important thing. Do you think it was more significant that, that, that Paul Coverdell was able to defeat Weich Fowler than, than Mac Mattingly being able yes. to defeat that, that 92 was a victory for, for Coverdell as opposed to, and, and this is not to besmirch the yeah, F-80, but yeah. a defeat for Talmadge. Yeah, well, but I mean, it was because, you remember Bill Clinton won in 92, mm -hmm. the same year that Coverdell won. And Coverdell, notwithstanding that, got the Senate seat. Mm -hmm. Not taking anything away from Mac, but that was, you know, Talmadge was already kind of going down the slippery very, slide. He was very vulnerable. Yeah, um, very vulnerable. For a, lot of, for a lot of personal reasons and political reasons. But also, since, since you mentioned, you know, staying on 92, that was the first election after the 91 redistricting um, that saw John Linder, uh, Mac Collins, and Jack Kingston elected to Congress. Were you involved as general counsel at, during that redistricting effort in 91? Uh, let, me, let me try to remember. Is that one Cynthia McKinney? Cynthia, the, uh, I, there was a deal basically. Yes, yeah, Cynthia McKinney and Sanford Bishop were also elected in 92. No, I'm, I'm talking so. about that there was a deal with the Oh, the Miller v. Johnson case? Well, uh, yeah, no, I'm not talking about cases. I'm talking about in terms of the map. Yes, that was the so-called Max Black. <clears throat> and, yeah, I was involved with that. Okay. We, we set up a organization called Georgians for Fair Redistricting, Inc. <laughs> and, yeah, but Frank knew more about that because Frank, that's his uh, election law is his. His special. Butter. So the, the, the effort, um, I guess it comes out of the, the amendments to the, the Voting Rights Act. Um, this says a majority minority districts is the goal. Um, and that was something that the, the Republican Party of Georgia, the, the RNC nationally embraced. Well, that was the, considered to be the law. If you could make a black district, you had, you to, had to. So with um, um, 94, is the, the so-called Republican Revolution, the, the contract with America. Um, did you have any, uh, you know, did you, did you play a role in any of those, those campaigns in 94? Um, the role I always played, I've contributed and I, uh, 
Uh, but by that time, the <clears throat> each of the campaigns had its enough muscle mm -hmm. from the evolution, the growing evolution of the party that they were on their own bottom. So, but very different from. I mean, if you think back to those, uh, yeah. the the Blackburn and Thompson, oh, where yeah, it yeah, was that was. Yeah. Um, 95, um, the beginning of the, the 96 presidential election cycle, you had supported Senator Dole back in 1988. Right. And, and you know, I, I suppose by extension, uh, when he was a vice presidential candidate with, with, with Gerald Ford back in 76. Tell me about Senator Dole and your relationship and wh why, why you were such a longtime supporter of his. He came down to a, a convention, state convention, in the 80s and I had heard that he was might be looking around to run so I managed to get to whoever was taking him around and on the convention floor and on the convention floor he went off to a side room and talked and said I'd like to help you out if you need help and the reason I did I liked the uh, fact he was a veteran, he'd been wounded. He was a uh, uh, establishment Republican. Mm -hmm. He had a funny, interesting personality. He didn't have any scandals. No. Uh, and I quite frankly thought Herbert Walker was a little bit of a wimp. So you you bought, you bought into sort of the yeah I kind of I yeah I mean it turned out not to have been so a wimp in that a was wimp there in, any not, there yeah there kind of substance I guess no a wimp and you know not the strong guy when he would walk into the room and everybody would say man this is a mm, mm. but I was wrong on that I mean he turned out to be a great president he made some mistakes. <clears throat> and certainly his war service, I knew about that, but uh, Dole had at least as good a war service as, uh, as Herbert Walker. So, you know, I wouldn't, I, before that I'd basically been with, we'd all been family, a bunch of us, you know, we were all supporting the same, but I kind of broke off from Frank and Fred and John Teasley and You know, Paul. Mm hmm Yeah. 96 was a much more successful uh, nomination uh, campaign for Senator Dole. Why, why do you, was it just his time in 96? Or, or was there something substantially different about the, the, the campaign organization strategy? Well, he, I don't know, he, he won Georgia, and I had bet with... Uh, He's the guy down at McKenna Long. He wound up being Canadian ambassador. Uh, Gordon Giffen. Yeah. Gordon and I had bet on the election, and it was the, the stakes were, were a stake at Bones. So he got to, he, being an honorable man, bought me a stake at Bones. <laughs> uh, I thought, also, you know, Dole came down to the Olympics. That's right, 96 Olympics, yeah, and, July, August. Yeah, he came down, and I got to walk around with him a good bit, and he was a big hit. He was, you know, a rock star. But he didn't have the money, and they had uh, the Clinton campaign had basically uh, identified him before. Mm -hmm. He got to identify himself again. They had basically identified him in a negative way. With okay. Him. And so Clinton was uh, reelected, notwithstanding Monica. Yeah, Clinton, uh, politically at least, seemed to turn it around 
uh, from 94, the real low point in 94. What do you think accounts for that, that he was able to pivot oh, so he, quickly uh, to become? Clinton was a, you know, superb politician. <clears throat> he knew the words to use. He looked good. He was able to, he was shielded a lot then, like they don't do anymore. Press, press, I mean, they jumped on him on Monica, but they basically, I mean, he, it wasn't just Monica that. Oh, certainly, there are yeah. many names out there. So, uh, yeah. you know, he was protected, unlike, uh, unlike Trump, where they're every little, you know, if he, SBO, they say something about it, but. Did you remain uh, active in, in party politics Absolutely. even after you you were general counsel? Uh, yeah, resigned yeah, as but general counsel? not. Yeah, by that time I was getting a little older too. And I, <clears throat> it's a young man's game. Young man in the sense of. You know, giving advice, position papers, and that kind of stuff, hiring the consultants. So, you know, I didn't do any of that. I, uh, I got involved in the ill-fated Mitch Candelakis. Which I love. Mitch was also a consummate politician. They just, he just, I mean, I don't know the facts, but apparently made some mistakes. Uh, referring to his, uh, his 98 um, lieutenant governor. Yeah. Run. Like that, that brings, you know, that makes me think of the question, you know, 1990s, really competitive especially the legislative and congressional levels, why weren't Republican candidates at the top of the ticket able to really break through, um, be it, it, Paul Coverdell is an exception, but, but Johnny Isaacson in 1990, Miller. Guy Milner the, in 94, 96, and 98. It just wasn't there yet. It did, you, but by 2002, um, you know, with, with, with uh, Sonny Perdue, uh, Saxby Chambliss. Do you think, how important was it for the Republican Party to put a, a middle Georgia face, a south Georgia face and voice on, on you know, out front as, as their sort of flagship candidates? That w it wasn't just a, a, a metro donut party anymore. Well, of course, that's certainly a factor. Well, you know, you would think... Kingston might have been able to uh, you know, uh, leverage his position. He's extremely popular on the, on the coast. But, but you make a good point. So, because Milner was silk stocking guy from Atlanta. Johnny would have been a fabulous governor. He's better. He he's actually can do more now as a senator or has been. Yeah, it, it took him it took him a while, but he finally did win that statewide. Um, well, he race. had he had some problem because he was he wasn't pure enough on the abortion issue. Right, something that you know something so that grew out of that Christian of right issue. On the, Republican side, which was not fair. You know, we, we've reached a period now in Georgia politics where every statewide elected officials are Republican. Uh, both United States senators, a majority of the, the, the congressional delegation, no longer a super majority in the state Senate, but it's majorities. That's irrelevant, yeah. Majorities, especially when, when the governor is a, a, right. a, a Republican. How did we go from the 1990s, early 2000s to 
total Republican dominance. In a relatively short period of time, 2002 is the election of Purdue. I think 2010 is where the election of every constitutional office. Uh, I think a huge part of it is that uh, people begin to perceive that the Democratic Party had gone too far left. Mm -hmm. That the days of the so where where you can make a distinction old, for the, Georgia the old, Democrat old, versus old Southern Dem conservative Democrat was was gone, and you know if you had a D by your name in 1950, then that was golden. If you Good had enough. A D by your name after they had turned gone left, then it wasn't golden. So that's the biggest thing to me. What do you think, if you, if you had to um, you know, put your finger on one or two things, what do you think the, the biggest or, or greatest danger to the Republican Party as a majority party in the state of Georgia might be? I'd say some scandal at the top. Mm -hmm. I'd say... getting enmeshed in uh, cultural wars that have very little incremental benefit politically, <clears throat> but have incremental uh, good downside. I think the Governor Deal has been able to escape that. Are, are you referring to the, the, the so-called religious freedom? Yeah, all of, the, all, or, of the, or, the, all of those things that, or, that... And the like, I suppose. That kind of get people going that aren't necessarily, shouldn't necessarily be political issues. They're individual, in my view, <coughs> religious related issues, but I mean, that's, the legislature shouldn't be legislating religion. What do you make of the, the, uh, the contention that, that the demographics of the state are changing in such a way that, that Democrats eventually will benefit. Well, they've been saying that for a long time. You know, next year we're going to really have the sort of the Brooklyn Dodgers wait till next year kind yeah. of. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is a fact. But it's not going to be just Democratic demographics that I can't assume that the African-American vote will always be Democratic. I mean, we may, so far, it's almost rubber stamp. Mm -hmm. um, it'll make it tougher, but we're talking about, you know, at least two election cycles away, in my view before there's any, unless we have a bad candidate. And that's, the, the, again, I that's, mean, I guess that's what the We can Alabama look to our neighbor showed. next door, right, yeah, right. I mean, you know, Alabama wasn't a Democratic-Republic thing. It was got a terrible candidate. Roy Moore and Roy not Roy Moore. Moore. I mean, you know, he's just. That's so, that sort of sums it up <laughs> pretty well. Um, what do you make of, of the fact that uh, we're, we're, we're in a, a post-Trump era, or I guess a Trump era, uh, with, with, with Donald Trump as Republican president uh, at the top of the ticket. There was a special election in the Georgia 6th, um, Tom Price's old, old district. John Ossoff, somebody nobody, nobody he's heard of. A loser. But, he was a loser then, but he's a, he's a loser. If they got another candidate, maybe. But, but what, what do you make of, of you know, Somebody you, you know you just described as such you know, finding forty eight point one percent of the vote in, in the Georgia sixth, you know North Fulton County, West East Cobb, yeah. North DeKalb. Yeah. Is that was that is he, that he he got the same he got less than the vote that Hillary Clinton got in that area, uh, and yet it was an open seat, and Karen's. Pretty solid. She's not made any mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to have that same because it's a special election. You're not going to have all the people with uh, MoveOn.org sending their twenty bucks 
in the ASAP. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't see it. In, in a, another series of special elections this past November, uh, you know, Democrats won back a couple seats uh, in Athens and the, the Athens area and the outlying areas. Do you think this is this is mainly a reaction to to last November with, with Donald Trump sort of energizing the I, Democratic I Party? I don't know anything about Athens. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think the Senate, the, the state Senate race for the Right. Jim Jordan Baker yeah. has had anything to do with Trump. I think there were just too many Republicans running and they split the vote. If you added up the Republican right. candidates' vote, they basically were on par with the uh, votes of the two Democratic candidates. So, mm -hmm. no, I don't think it was a Trump thing at all in the, in the state Senate race. Athens, I don't know. I just don't know that race. What do you think, you know, you know projecting out 10, 20 years, the, that the, the Republican Party organization looks like, or, or the Republican Party's delegation? What, what does it look like in terms of composition or, or priorities? Well, it won't include me, because I'm, <laughs> I'm 78. <laughs> uh, Don't sell yourself <laughs> short. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, that's impossible. I didn't right. know. I don't, I think the, the better question is, uh, do, will parties still matter? Qua parties, and we, in the age of uh, Citizens United and, and outside groups or well, just I mean, institutions. Twenty years generally. from now, I mean, how much influence? How much influence have the parties had in any of the last elections? I mean, they've helped skew it toward Democratic Party, helped skew it toward Hillary, but. But the reaction really, to that may be the yeah, fact that they did. I mean, the candidates now look mostly at the parties as a way to legally do conduit money. Just, just a vehicle of sorts. Yeah, it's a legal vehicle. You can put it in. They can do the get out the vote. The party can do that, and uh, you can have corporate money. Or I mean, there's some. That's a But I, you know, I think I don't think parties will be as important. Sort of a you know, come, coming full circle, weak party organizations, some growth, and then just no on either side. Just I mean, either I think side. The, no. I mean, why would that's this question? Why would a party survive? What are the, what purpose is, purpose does it serve? Apart from the the, the, uh, the formal the, the statutory the statutory thing, they certify candidates. They do the mechanics. They kind of do it for money. Uh, they may have pick candidates. And all this is good, and all those things are good. But I mean, is that is the in the age of androids? I mean, are we? <laughs> I just can't answer the question. Sure, sure. Well, is there anything else? Um, oh, we mentioned when we were off camera, um, Paul Coverdell, his his passing in two thousand. You were you were up at the the convention. Um, I think he passed away July mid July. I, I I'm not sure of the day. Maybe seventeenth or something like that. What was it like trying to scramble to find a candidate to to compete against Zell Miller of all people, who Governor Barnes had pretty well, shrewdly appointed? Yeah, I wasn't on the inside power on that. You had Lewis Jordan, who's some people were pushing. Uh, and that probably would not have been a good choice. So, I think you probably asked Fred about that. I think Fred was involved in mm -hmm. that. 